Moi sangge cho don so ge cho nam nai jan chu ma du da ni gap su chi da ge chen yen ge pe so nam ge ro la pen che sangge ru pa sho sangge cho don so ge cho nam na jan chu ba du da ni gap su chi Dagi chunyan gi pe sonam gi, rola penje sangge rupa sho, sangge churam so gi chunam la, jan chu badu dani gap su chi, dagi chunyan gi pe sonam gi, rola penje sangge rupa sho. And so just allowing the refuge in Bodhicitta to connect, to revive, to strengthen, and to direct all of our actions. Okay, so you can relax your attention. Um, normally, we would um, go from what 1800 to 1830. Um, but since we started a little late, we'll go encroach into the break just a little bit. I hope that works for everybody. Um, let's see. And then for the Yeah, let's see the discussion. I guess we just have to play it by ear. I don't want people to feel like they need to stay longer than they've prepared for. Um, so if any time you need to uh, head out, that's okay. And I'll just try and give half hour presentation, half hour discussion, break, half hour meditation as planned, um, but we'll go slightly over time today. So hope that's all right. Um, as with last time, I'm drawing mainly from Cutting Through Appearances by Geshe Hlundrup Zopa from Deer Park and An Offering Cloud of Nectar by His, His Eminence Chudin Rinpoche, as well as the oral instructions of Girmay Kenser Rinpoche Geshe Tashi Sering. So that's the main source of my presentation and the translation that we're using is Lama Zopa Rinpoche's. And of course, any mistakes are my own and apologies. Last time we looked at renunciation and the context and context. So I'll just skip through those first verses, but basically look at the heading, the pledge to compose, and then urging the disciples to listen. And those main points about um, the preliminaries, they kind of start out with a summary from Lama Tsongkhapa of what the three principal aspects of the path are in brief. And then you go into renunciation specifically. And now we're gonna move into bodhicitta. But since you last were talking, um, last week you talked by yourself and then in discussion the week before, what did you come to as kind of the main essence of renunciation, the determination to be free, this intention of definite emergence? What's kind of the essence of it? What does it want to do? Freeze day. Oh. Okay. No, no, please. No, I just thought about uh, this uh, inner saying, enough is enough. Mm. Yeah. And uh, the real understanding, there's no, nothing out there. So it's like really like enough is enough. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good way of putting it. Yep, absolutely. Uh I thought of a, a release, um, sorry, an understanding of samsara for what it is, a continuing cycle of, of dissatisfaction, let's say, and a yearning to, to be free from that, to be released, or to release myself from that. Yeah, 
yeah, you're, you guys are hitting the two main things. It's like disillusionment with hope, <laughs> you know, hope for freedom, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and those are the two key components. You want to be enough is enough, as Sigal said, and you want to have this urge for freedom, as David said, it, you know, this real urge that says, I've been doing the same old thing from beginningless time, and it hasn't led to my awakening. And I keep hurting myself and I keep hurting other people because of this foundational ignorance, which is just really not my fault, but in so many ways problematic. Let's aggressively attack it without identifying with it, without feeling bad because of it, without shame and guilt and all of that mess, none of that, but say, this is really a problem. And it's a problem that I don't need to keep having. So let's be kind of grossed out by it while at the same time be so kind of re-identified with the Buddha nature, kind of re, you know, switch your identity from your afflictions and your personality and your surface stuff to what has been with you from beginningless time, which is the fact that your mind is empty of inherent existence and therefore can transform, you know? And that potentiality is something that is far more, stably you, even there, even though there is no inherently existent self, there is a continuous Buddha nature. And that's a much more accurate place to put your identity. So then it gives you this urge for freedom. What, what came up when trying to like, make it happen for yourself? <laughs> what do you do to make renunciation happen in your head, in your heart? How do you cultivate disillusionment? <laughs> How do you cultivate hope? I think it came out, it came up a lot uh, last year, that, uh, last uh, week, that we only think about it really when we are having difficulties. And uh, not, not when uh, attachment uh, looks like a nice thing. We, we, we are sick of samsara only when bad things are happening. I guess. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But we're not sick of samsara when it's wonderful and delicious and entertaining. Yeah. Yeah. That's, we have to break the spell. You know, it really is. It's like a spell we've cast over ourselves and we were our own magician. <laughs> we did it to ourselves, but it's like this fog of pleasure completely kills our willpower you know, because we have these little like crumbs of happiness and it's all we've ever known. So who wants to give up their crumbs? You know, it's like, don't take that from me. It's all I have, you know, and renunciation isn't saying you can't have that, but it sort of feels like it or it makes you distracted. It also came up that exactly that because we don't have like our best experience is when attachment looks good. And we don't have experiences of uh, like little enlightenment, or we don't have anything to compare to. We don't have anything better to compare to. So that's, I don't know. That's uh, that's something that came up came up a lot last year. Yes, last week also. Yeah, it's it's a good point. We don't have a reference, you know, for what what's the better. You know, we have some days in our life that went pretty well. And we're like, let's have more of those days that went well, less of those days that didn't go well. But we have no frame of reference for what enlightenment is going to be. I think what we do have is moments of grounded clarity that have a lot of contentment, where for a brief moment in time, we got over ourselves. You know, those like brief moments in time when you stopped prioritizing self-centered needs and consciously we're prioritizing the needs of the whole without a mo without a martyred feeling but with a very strong deep sense of interconnectedness and there was like a deep joy in working for others you know without pressure without expectations but just a, like a little glimmer of when we got over ourselves do you know that one like that that deep contentment 
you're not like excited being a hostess or a host trying to make everybody happy and it, you know, I don't know, well fed, not like that. <laughs> but you know, but maybe it was when you were a host or a hostess of something, but you were just really standing back from the situation and wondering, how can I make this the best for everyone joyfully? Do you know what I'm talking about? That it, it, it different than a regular kind of bouncy happiness, but like a steady, calm joy. I've and had that, bouncy. bouncy. Yeah, bu <laughs> <laughs> we've had sugar high happiness of various types. No. <laughs> no, I mean the bouncy happiness isn't necessarily bad. It's just that so often excited mind comes from attachment, which means when it finishes, it crashes rather than going back down to equilibrium. It's very rare for us to have this like spike of happiness and then to even out. Usually it's a spike of happiness and then a crash of despair or fatigue or disillusionment or disconnect. You know, it's like you have a wonderful holiday, but then you need to like recover from your holiday. <laughs> now that, and you know, yeah, yeah, what, Debbie, go. How about uh, without recalling, without relating the incident, I, I did have a, a bouncy happiness. Um, and how about recalling that and using that as, as a base for, to, to say to myself, that is what I'm looking for on a long-term basis, not necessarily a high, um, but it, was, uh, it wasn't something that I drank or smoked. It was something that I did for somebody else. Um, uh, and to you, use that memory as a, as a starting point, as a base. I, I think there is something to that. I, I think that it's more like, it shows you what your capacity for joy can be. And there's more even than that, but it, it's almost like it's showing you. It's like a reference. It's like my mind can actually be that happy. It has the capacity for that amount of joy. What I need to look at now are the kind of more consistent conditions to bring that about more stably rather than chasing the external conditions that just happen to come together for that moment in time. So it's like, it's showing you something about your mind's own abilities. You know, just okay. like um, if you've been in the depths of despair or in the, you know, throes of an addiction of some kind or some horrible pain, you know, like you broke something that can show you the capacity of the mind for suffering and shock you into, if I was in a lower state, I would be like that all the time. My mind has the capacity to feel that bad my body has the capacity to feel that, that bad. And if conditions come together internally and externally, that's what my life could be always, <laughs> you know, not always forever, but like continuously yeah. for a long time. So I think similarly, you can show yourself your own joy and say, my mind can do that because it's done it before. You know, my mind can do that. So oh, let's just create causes for more of it. The, the trick is to not get lost in the surface context, you know, and, and to kind of feel like you can get all of the ingredients right to make it happen again, because we don't have control over all of the ingredients. You know, the main ingredient we have control over is our mind, but even that we don't have complete control over. You can't like will yourself into joy just like right now if you're grumpy and be like, <laughs> you know so shut your eyes and squeeze it out happy you know you can't force it if it's not coming um but you can kind of gently navigate what you know to be things that will ripen a positive seed so karmically speaking um renunciation and karma discussions go together really beautifully as long as we don't get lost in trying to create the wrong kind of good karma that kind of creates formless realm experiences and we get, get lost in pleasure and forget about the suffering of sentient beings. So I always find it's quite interesting that the three principal aspects of the path talk about perfect human rebirth, even though that's not one of the three principal aspects of the path, 
they kind of launch it with that remember that you have a perfect human rebirth, that it's rare and that it's precious. And you're in that perfect sweet spot of having enough trouble and enough support. A little bit more trouble, too distracting. A little bit more support pleasure, too distracting. We're in that sweet spot. <laughs> and that's a really difficult balance to strike. So, you know, if we are lost in pleasure at our stage, it's really likely that we'd forget about sentient beings. Hopefully not. But, you know, when you're on a beach in Bali, you know, I don't know, drinking Mai Tais, I don't know what people drink now, you know, it, do you think, oh, you know what, I'm going to use all of this relaxation and joy to give myself momentum for my practice, to work for the welfare of all sentient beings and donate all of the rest of my money to charity and I don't know, blah, blah, blah. You know, you usually are just like, ah. <laughs> you know, and other things don't occur to you and it's totally natural but it's why we need to kind of be jolted into altruism through recognizing our own pain so it's very hard to have deep compassion going into bodhicitta if you don't first have renunciation if you don't have renunciation for your own situation you don't really see the incredible tragedy of the situation of others you know, you, you have too much distance from it. It's like, there's no pathways of empathy. Yeah, Yun, did you want to ask something? We can't oh, we can't hear you, hon. <laughs> Technology problems. Ah, oh, yeah, type me in the chat, perfect. Yeah, Il, Il, did you, you had, I saw a hand earlier. Yeah, it was just, um, uh, I wanted to add to the conversation that we also talked about if you can't find renunciation within you, then talking about examples of people who have renunciated, I think, is also helpful. And sometimes that it's meaningful to meet someone who seems to be more connected to that um, path. And so it's something that is more tangible to aspire to when mm -hmm. it's hard to find it within yourself. Yeah, it's true. You kind of need to see someone doing quite well with less, you know, le less relationship, less materials, less stimuli, and somehow more happy. And it kind of helps prove it to you that this can really work. If you ever go to Dharamsala, you can visit some of the, the yogis up the mountain, you know, and they're just hanging out in their little hovel with their like bag of tzampa and their bag of tea. And they are happy. They are happy, you know, and you think, hmm, <laughs> something to this Buddhism. <laughs> Maybe I should meditate. I don't know. <laughs> Seems to be working out. So um, I thought I'd share just the summary from Chudan Rinpoche's commentary, because it's a nice little summary of renunciation, and then we'll go into um, bodhicitta. So you discussed. Okay, so Chudan Rinpoche says we should reflect repeatedly on the non-deceptive nature of karmic results and the suffering of samsara. So if we want to get ourselves solid renunciation, we have to keep thinking about how karma works and how we are the agent of our own pain. And, you know, kind of really develop that, as Seagal said, enough is enough, but also that hope that we can get out of it. So there's two components to an uncontrived mind that wishes to attain the abandonment that has abandoned all types of afflictions and the freedom that is free from samsara that has the nature of suffering. At that time, we have generated the thought of renunciation. So it's this uncontrived mind that wishes to attain the abandonment and the freedom. Yeah, to get rid of and to get. Yeah, or get rid of and get out of <laughs> both. And further, once we have seen samsara in general as having the nature of suffering and generate the mind seeking freedom, this is renunciation. However, in order to generate pure renunciation, we should continuously view samsara as having the nature of suffering at all times, night and day, without generating even for one instant, 
the wish to obtain any kind of samsaric excellence. So this is aspirational, right? Like right now we still want samsaric happiness or samsaric excellence, right? After this, we're gonna have a cup of tea and we're gonna have a snack and we're gonna have a rest and we're gonna do all sorts of samsaric pleasures. And in fact, we should at our level because if we clear out everything that gives us temporary happiness, will trigger deprivation mentality. Will trigger this sense of need and want and empty and nothing. And that will turn into a despair or it will turn into a rebellion that says to hell with this and will become worse than before. So the, the real thing here is pacing. What's the pace at which I can gently develop my renunciation without any backlash? So he continues by saying, when the mind thinking to attain the freedom that is free from samsara is generated spontaneously, at that time we have generated pure and uncontrived renunciation. So that word uncontrived that you see repeated in all of these kind of like criteria for having it conversations, it really means that it's spontaneous because of familiarity. It comes out without needing extra effort because you put in tons of effort initially. So he says, when we generate such renunciation and have become familiar with the three types of training, ethics, concentration, wisdom, not only do we have the capacity to attain the mere state of personal freedom from samsara, but this renunciation also acts as the cause of Buddhahood. So not just nirvana. However, if it is not qualified by the awakening mind, meaning bodhicitta, this renunciation does not become a perfect cause. Despite having familiarity with renunciation, if we are not influenced by the awakening mind, we become diverted from the path that leads to Buddhahood. And having entered a path of the lesser vehicle, even the path itself does not become pleasant. Therefore, for renunciation to become a perfect cause for Buddhahood and a pleasant path leading directly to Buddhahood, it must be qualified by bodhicitta. So it's, Chen Rinpoche was an exemplar of renunciation. He, instead of running and, you know, kind of doing refugee stuff when the Chinese invasion came, which of course is completely understandable and very good that many of our lamas did that. Chudin Rimshe just went into retreat in somebody's house, in a room with nothing on the walls. I think sometimes he had to wear lay clothes to pretend he wasn't a monk. And sometimes he could wear semi robes. All he had was his prayer beads. All he had was his mala that he kept in a secret pocket in his, and that's all he had for like 17 years. And he just pretended to be somebody's invalid uncle, basically, you know, somebody's sick uncle and a family, you know, made sure he was fed and watered. And he just did his practice in a little crappy room in a noisy family house with nothing and he just quietly got the job done. And then finally, when he moved to India and was able to escape and then started teaching, it was just this blissful, still clarity. The quality of the way he taught was so spacious. There was just so much. And he talked very, very quietly. If you ever went to his teachings, you know, he passed away a few years ago, but he taught in this little whisper. And his translator always had to kind of lean in. And then all the students would kind of lean in. And it was just this incredible, deep quiet that was so joyful. And he didn't just magically come out of nowhere like that. That was the result of years of renunciation. But informed by Bodhicitta, it's like he was doing this for us the whole time. And that kept his joy up. You know, sometimes working on the path just for yourself, on one sense, we can say, oh, that's self-centered or that's limited. But on the other hand, it's actually not as fun either. 
just working for yourself, it's like you can do enough to make yourself okay and then just kind of leave it at that. But if you're thinking others could really use the best of me, and if the best of me was more vast and more deep, my impact would be so much more and the benefit would be so much more to them. And so for their sake, I need to work on myself, you know, for all sentient beings, but the specific ones I interact with every day, these are ones I have this strong karmic connection with, whether I like it or not, you know, your random coworkers, your family members, you just can't help but see all the time, you know, just the people in your life, they are having such a benefit from how much work that you do and remembering that kind of can keep the momentum up. If that makes sense. Yeah. So it looks like there's a question in the chat. Um, so this is from Yun, who's my friend from New Zealand, who is now also in America and is a wonderful practitioner. You guys would love him if he was in Israel with you. <laughs> but he says, regarding renunciation, is that something that we first develop in terms of a contrived state of mind through remembering this, the three, six, eight types of suffering and the benefits of enlightenment and then later stabilize um, through a stabilized mind of insight? Um, or is it a state of mind of just like true understanding? So it's a really good question. In, in the beginning, it is contrived um, and the gateway to the Mahayana path is uncontrived renunciation with uncontrived bodhicitta, those two together is the path of accumulation. But in the beginning, it's just as you say, to think about the three types of suffering, the six types of suffering, the eight types of suffering, all with the background of these all come from karma. These all come from negative states of mind that were driven by suffering, that were driven by ignorance. Remembering that then, your view of suffering changes. So rather than seeing suffering as something that you don't want, but you put up with, or you don't want, but you reframe, you look at suffering as something that has very specific reasons. And if you see the specific reasons, you can kill the specific reasons. And so then you feel more empowered and you start really looking at, all right, what's the regular trouble I experience? Is it, you know, people are always critical to me or people are always dismissive or is it something, you know, something of that type, a pattern that happens again and again. And then that makes you go, oh, I was that guy. <laughs> you know, I was that bureaucrat or I was that difficult boss or I was that difficult partner. And instead of feeling bad about yourself or mad at them, you become strategic and you think, okay, so I need to stop creating the cause for more of that. And I need to start purifying all my past stuff of that type. And I zero in specifically on that as my kind of project. And it really can become a very enriching process. It's, it's interesting to play with in this way. I, um, I don't know how many of you know this, but I've had a lot of trouble with bureaucrats, with like visa stuff, with healthcare stuff, with air, airline stuff. I always have some sort of like minor difficulty or like big obstacle whenever I have to do something involving paperwork. You know, even if I'm so organized, even if I do everything perfectly, somehow there's a problem. And so I know I was a terrible bureaucrat. I was a really uptight, snotty bureaucrat. And, and so I was thinking about that because yesterday I was coming home from running errands and I stopped at a fast food place that now has vegan burgers. Do you know this? Burger King has impossible burgers. It's so exciting. So, so I, was being, I was being very lazy and I stopped to get my, my vegan burger, my impossible burger. And I saw the kid um, doing the burgers, wasn't wearing his mask, you know, and in, in Montana, there's still a little bit of problem with COVID and not everybody has their vaccine. And I felt the bureaucrat come up and I said, tell that kid to put his mask on. And then I thought, all right, so I'm right, but I'm wrong, right? Like I'm correct, he should put his mask on and probably someone should tell him, but this energy in me that feels entitled to tell him what to do 
is a problem. <laughs> I need to cut this out, <laughs> right? And I could just, I could feel it. I was like becoming, I don't know, like his supervisor, like a parent, like a obnoxious everything. And it's like, even though I was right, I was wrong. And I thought to myself, this is why you have problems at airports. <laughs> you know, you have done this a million times, like cut it out kid. And um, it, it really reminded me that even though we might have a socially acceptable version of the problem now, it's still echoes of a theme. Yeah, so we might have really gotten some of our bad behavior under control, but we haven't purified the karma of it and we haven't gotten rid of the kind of like shadows of it still creep into our life. So it can really give you your own power back rather than thinking what is wrong with people all the time. You really consciously try to find those places within yourself and, and kind of get rid of them, right? As best as you can, or at least gently <laughs> take the edge off, yeah, for example. Yeah, and we have far more scary, severe examples in our life, I'm sure. People have probably done horrible things to us in our life that we in no way deserved. Yeah, that were not justified by any sense. And we didn't deserve it and it shouldn't have happened. And the people that did it to us should not have done that. And they have very heavy karma because of that. And we created the cause at some point somewhere in the past. And thinking in those terms, again, helps us take the power back. So we don't feel like things are so random that we're such victims of circumstance. We look for the tiny, tiny echoes of that in their socially acceptable, polite form that we can get away with and really look at trying to challenge those a little bit and the mentality underneath them, particularly. Yeah. So karma is really important. Okay. Yes. Yeah, David, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm taking all the time. No, no. Um, go. On, the, on the example that you just gave about the, the burger flipper, um, I'm sure that... Um, I'm sure that a lot of learned uh, yourself and, um, and other learned people in the Dharma could hold a debate on that very issue for weeks um, as regards him and as regards you. But, but perhaps it was a chance to further body cheetah by maybe approaching the fact that, oh, his manager might see him and fire him. Or maybe the guy just forgot and would be happy if he's reminded. So would it not be correct to, to uh, what I'm asking is, mm -hmm. it, would it be correct to say, please put your mask on it in a polite way without any attachments, without attachments? Um, that's yeah. the question. I mean, yeah, and that, that comes up a million times in a day, doesn't it? Where it's like... Yeah. There's a good way to do it and there's a bad way to do it, but the, the appearance of it is going to be very similar. You know, we're nice people, we're polite people. Sometimes there's an edge to our voice, sometimes there's rudeness, but generally we're nice enough people. It's all about the mentality. And my, my suggestion is, and take it or leave it, but my suggestion is if you know yourself to have a strong habit of something of one category, even if the words coming out of your mouth are correct to just shut up, <laughs> you know? And I said that to myself, of course, after the fact, you know, in the yeah. moment I felt very righteous. Like I was doing a service to all Burger King patrons, <laughs> you know, tell that kid to put his mask on, you know, like, so it's like, even though I was right for me, I know I need to really watch that tendency, the like school marm tendency you know, the bureaucrat tendency. And so in a perfect world, I would have noticed the urge, caught myself, stopped, adjusted to bodhicitta, and then said it from bodhicitta. In a perfect world, you're hundred percent right. But because things happen so quickly in the moment, it's kind of like often our best solution is maybe just not, <laughs> maybe just no, <laughs> you know. Okay. And then, you know, kind of uh, elevated, upgraded is um, stop yourself, recalibrate, and then do it from the right place. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. And we have to just, you know, choose in the moment. Life goes so quickly. Yeah. 
But that's the thing is that usually we do the opposite. We think even though I'm angry, it's the right thing to say. So I'm going to do it anyway, because it's the right thing to say. So even though I'm angry, I'm going to do it. That's usually our reasoning. And I'm challenging us to say, what about the other way around? What if even it is the right thing to say, but my reason is wrong. So shut the heck up. Just as an exercise in these little moments where it doesn't really matter. Right. Probably, you know, five other people will tell the burger flipper to put his mask on and he's just being a rebellious teenager and saying to hell with it. Like, what impact will I have on his life? But, you know, when it comes to big things, of course, you know, you make a statement, you know, you don't wait and say, am I angry or not? If a child is running out into traffic, you just grab them, you know, (laughs) you don't stop and think about it. But in these little moments where it doesn't really matter to kind of challenge yourself to say, Uh, that's a bit of a pattern of mine. Let's just zip it. It's tricky. Okay. Yeah. And everybody's so different. You know, for some people, it's like their, their tendency from an affliction might be to always be silent and to always zip it. And that's part of their affliction. And so they need to kind of challenge themselves to say something, you know? So it's really, it's personal, isn't it? What's kind of our way into renunciation yeah okay thank you (laughs) yeah it's complicated (laughs) It, it is and you know at the end of the day it's all about motivation but do we really know what our motivation is you know we we say to ourselves what we want our motivation to be but it takes a little bit for it to you know become authentic and to like really sink in do you, do you know what I mean? You might think I'm doing this for the benefit of all sentient beings and there's no flavor to it. And then you say it again and then you say it again in your mind, in your heart until finally there's like a little warming <laughs> and the heart kind of warms up again and kind of, you know, becomes open again. And sometimes it is just repetition to make a motivation that you want to have be the motivation you actually have. The danger, I think, is telling yourself what your motivation is when you're full of it, you know, and then you kind of do spiritual bypassing or you jump over the emotions that you really need to deal with or, you know, there's Mm. the the danger of jumping to reframe before you've acknowledged where you are. So it's like you, you go to what is my reframing? What is my mind training method? And then kind of push pause and kind of look back, okay, so where am I in relation to that genuinely? And, you know, like that. Pro tip. (laughs) So, okay, so continuing on and we'll get into bodhicitta and you guys can have a discussion time. Um, So verse six then going on, even if renunciation has been developed, If it is not possessed by the mind of enlightenment, it does not become the cause of the perfect bliss of unsurpassed enlightenment. Therefore, the wise generate the supreme mind of enlightenment. And so here we get the recommendation for practicing sevenfold cause and effect. And I think most of you know this one, where you start with the essential foundation of bodhicitta or of um, you start with the essential foundation of immeasurable equanimity. Yeah, the impartial goodwill, whether someone's friend, enemy, or stranger, you wish them well, and you see them equal and just wanting happiness, not wanting suffering, and you get your mind even and stable. And then you go into the sevenfold cause and effect. So the side note here is don't get it confused with seven point mind training. Seven point mind training is a slightly different practice. It's all related, but it's a different practice. So the causes are the first six and the effect is bodhicitta. So recognizing all sentient beings have been one's mother, remembering their kindness, wishing to repay their kindness, love, compassion, highest intention. That all as a group triggers or leads or is a catalyst for bodhicitta. Yeah. And um, maybe somebody's got background noise. Maybe David, do you mind just muting for a little bit? 
just for the background noise. Oh, it's difficult. Um, I'm not sure what I can do. I'll turn oh, OK, juice. that's OK. No problem. Perfect, perfect. And then, of course, unmute for the discussion. Of course, of course. OK, so sevenfold cause and effect. We talk about this all the time. It comes up all the time. The common complaints are what? I don't like my mother. Why do I want to see all sentient beings as having been my mother? Or I have a complicated relationship with my mother. I don't want to see all sentient beings as with complicated relationship. Um, th those kind of classics. And then why mother, why not father? My father was really kind to me. My mother was awful and withheld affection, whatever randomness you say to yourself. Okay, so you just kind of shake it off and remember the Buddha is talking about archetypal mothers, the mother archetype. They're talking about that idealized human relationship, which doesn't always happen, but the idealized version of someone who is so selfless that they give even their body for you. They give their time for you. They give their, you know, um, attention, energy, they'll lose sleep over you, all for you. And if you have a mother like that, and you know, lots of my Israeli friends have mothers like that, so that's lovely. But sometimes there's also then the added enmeshment issue, <laughs> right? So, so there's like all of this love and you're like love flooded and they're all in your business and they're making sure you have socks even though you're 35 and you know, it's a whole thing. Um, you know, it's like, it's lovely, <laughs> it's lovely, but there's also like tendrils of enmeshment and codependency. So, so take those bits out <laughs> and just think of like the purest form. Maybe when you were six months old and you wouldn't stop crying and she was totally exhausted and hadn't slept well for weeks and she got up one more time to comfort you, even though it was the last thing she wanted to do. You know, like that, that kind of love. She was tired, she was over it, but she knew that you needed her. And so she picked you up one more time and just held you until you felt soothed. You know, and, you know, she fed you even though her body hurt and was aching and raw and parched and chapped and just, oh, you know, and she just fed you again, you know, and she was just with you so present. Yeah, so present. Think of how mothers are with the tiny fragile baby would die without her. That kind of love. So, you know, you just, even if you've not experienced that love as an adult or try and remember that love as a baby, even though you don't remember it, it gave you the legacy of being able to love now. You know, it like it taught you how to love. And now all of your deepest friendships, maybe your relationship with your spouse, maybe your closest friend, your ability to connect in a deep way is because it was taught. You know, you had a, you know, you had your Buddha nature, you had your habituation, you came in able to love, but you needed conditions to kind of wake that ability up again. And your mother really helped with that or your primary caregiver. So you just take this archetypal idea of the perfect love a human can have and use it as your basis to try and develop affection for all sentient beings. So it's an interesting idea that affection depends on a feeling of like closeness and gratitude. And if there's a lot of like uncomplicated gratitude, you know, like no strings attached gratitude, and a feeling of closeness, you almost can't help but love someone if you have those two factors. Yeah, closeness and gratitude. It's like you start to see them as appealing. You see them as like attractive, not in a romantic sense, but just in an appealing, I want to be close to you sense. Like all of your facial features make me happy. I love that one weird wrinkle. I like that one of your nostrils is smaller than the other. Like all of the stuff that's unique to their face, you, you love it because of this closeness and this gratitude. And it kind of turns into, I really wanna repay that kindness. Meaning I want you to be happy, right? I want you to be happy genuinely. And I want you to be free from suffering, genuinely from my heart 
not because I'm a good child who should do the right thing, but because from the depths of me, I just feel such gratitude. And that turns into the highest intention of great compassion, which is, therefore, it's my responsibility to do what I can to enact that. The best way is if I become enlightened. And so those, those six turn into the seventh, just very organically. And so to think all sentient beings have been your mother, you do start with logic, thinking, all right, time is beginningless. Sentient beings are finite. Though numberless, though so many sentient beings, there are no new sentient beings being created. One, because nothing comes out of nowhere. Yeah, that there's nothing that sort of just pops into existence causelessly. Therefore, everyone is beginningless, just like time is beginningless and consciousness is beginningless and all of those things, you know, from philosophy. So there's a whole bunch of sentient beings, but they are not new ones. Time is beginningless. You've bumped into each other, right? And they can use, you know, like pictorial examples, like if you had a jar with a thousand grains of rice and you painted one grain of rice blue and that blue grain of rice is you and you put it in there and you shook, 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 shook. The, eventually that little blue grain of rice would touch all the other grains of rice eventually if you just kept shaking. <laughs> so kind of think of that as like all sentient beings, you and time, <laughs> right? And of course, some grains of rice, that little blue one touches more often, right? There was maybe, you know, shake, shake, shake. It's stuck with the same 10 and just kept bumping into the same 10 for ages before it kind of broke free and <laughs> started hitting another group. And that's like our family and our friends and the people we just keep running into. But really think, you, my sister, my brother have been my mother, my partner, my best friend, you've been my mother my coworker, my worst enemy, you've been my mother. Because they have literally been your mother. They've been that close, they've been that kind. And yes, they've also been your enemy and they've also been predator and prey and all those things, but you're looking at ways to touch the heart. And you're not seeing them as your child, even though they've also been your child, because that makes it less likely that you're gonna hold them up in this sense of respect. Yeah. So if you see all sentient beings as being your child, you see them as close and you want to take care of them, but it doesn't do the same thing as lifting them up into you took care of me when I couldn't even wipe my own bum or blow my own nose or feed myself. You know, it's like it's a humbling sort of thing happens to you. And then you go into remembering her kindness. So you can think of your actual mother's kindness or mothers that you've seen or mothers in the animal kingdom or, you know, just mothers, what they do, and then move on through the steps like that. <laughs>